Since the beginning of time, great speeches have shaped the world. Martin Luther King's, I have a dream to fight for equal rights. John F. Kennedy's, we're going to the moon when we took one huge step for mankind. Winston Churchill's, we shall fight on the beaches before we storm the beaches at Normandy. But no words have shaped our world like those found in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. These words have created new worldviews. They've elevated ethics, and they've captured the imaginations of philosophers and thinkers, both Christian and secular alike. These ancient words spoken by a rabbi on a mountainside in first century Palestine have been more read, repeated, and studied than almost any other words in history. They've been written about in countless books, spoken about in countless sermons, and they've been the subject of the most intense theological debates. Why? These words act as an invitation to reimagine how we see the world. These words created a culture and will do it again today. A kingdom culture. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Let's go. Well, good morning, Stone Creek Church. My name is Mike Reinsel. If we haven't had the chance to meet, I'm one of the pastors here on staff. And last week, we launched a new sermon series called Kingdom Culture. Kingdom Culture, where we are digging into chapter 5 through 7 of the Gospel of Matthew, looking at the Servant of the Mount and saying, what is Jesus saying about the culture, the kingdom, the culture of the kingdom that he is inviting us into? And if you weren't here last week, I want to really encourage you to go back and listen because our senior pastor, Stephen Gibbs, preached the best message he has ever preached in his entire life as he preached the entire Sermon on the Mount, all three chapters, all five pages, all 107 verses, and all 2,000 plus words from memory. Incredible. Now, throughout history, there have been leaders who have issued their declarations or their manifestos of their vision of what they see the future should look like. You just heard some of them up there, MLK, Churchill, Gandhi, JFK, Billy Graham, all people who shared a vision of a future that was different than the present that the people were accustomed to. And through time, all different kinds of leaders who uh, have been part of history have said, this is what society ought to look like. And if they're really the right leaders, not just a vision of what society ought to look like, but also a tangible plan to get there. Essentially saying, this is how the world should be, and this is what I'll do to make that vision a reality. And we're looking today and for the next several weeks as we dive deep into the Sermon on the Mount at arguably the greatest of all sermons and manifestos. This is Jesus stepping into the scene and giving a vision for the kingdom of God and not just a vision for what his kingdom will look like, but also for the values and the characteristics that make up the people within his kingdom. And those characteristics are the Beatitudes that we are looking at this morning. Jesus. Jesus steps into this scene in history with the Sermon on the Mount saying, I am the king. And if you want to be part of my kingdom, here's what your life is going to look like. And he's not saying that these are prerequisites for getting into the kingdom. I want you to have that straight in your mind. No, what Jesus is saying is that when we embrace and value the things of the kingdom, we actually become the kingdom that he describes. Over time, we'll be molded and shaped into the type of person he describes in the Beatitudes. And Jesus says that these characteristics that he's describing in the Beatitudes will differentiate you from the people who are outside of his kingdom. Jesus is basically saying, I'm the king, and this is how I want the people within my kingdom to live. And if you're a part of my kingdom, if and you, if you really embrace the kingdom living that I'm going to tell you about, you will look different from the people who are outside of my kingdom. And if we allow him to, if we really allow him to, over time, Jesus remodels us into the kinds of people that he wants us to be, into Jesus people and into kingdom people. 
And when we truly become those people, we gradually look materially different from the world around us. Now, your life might not need a complete makeover. Maybe it's not a Chip and Joanna Gaines, bring it down to the studs, total gut and redo type of thing. But I promise you that if you allow him to, Jesus will begin to renovate your life. He might renovate your prayer life and take it from a couple of minutes of prayer over meals to a robust 30-minute daily practice of prayer. He might renovate your calendar and cause you to serve in prison ministry instead of going on that golf weekend that you had planned. And he might renovate your giving priorities and make you invest in saving trafficked girls instead of taking that big family vacation to the Caribbean that you've been planning. Now, I don't know what renovations Jesus might have for you, but be careful because Jesus is in the business of renovating lives. Now, when we talk about kings and kingdoms, anyone could stand up here and and just claim to be king and invite people into their kingdom. And there have certainly been lots of false kings and false kingdoms throughout the course of history. Heck, I could stand up here today in front of you and claim to be king and tell you all about the wonderful kingdom that I want you to be a part of. And if I were king, if I were king, I would give you a reserved parking space right out in the front row with your name on it, not only here at Stone Creek, but down at Avalon. And if I were king, if I were king, I would have zero calorie Mexican food, including the chips and the cheese dip, zero calories. And if I were king... Anyone who was ever late for anything that went on in my kingdom would be automatically banished from the kingdom because I grew up in a family that said that early is on time and on time is late. But the difference, the difference between my kingdom and Jesus' kingdom is that he actually backs up the promises of his kingdom. Last week's scripture that Gary Hayden read for us is from Matthew 4, 23 and 24. And it describes, it describes the scene that leads into the Sermon on the Mount. The gospel reads like this. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. And so his fame spread throughout all Syria. And they brought him all the sick, all those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, And he healed them. This was the scene leading into the Sermon on the Mount that Stephen preached last week. Jesus was performing miracles. He was healing the sick. He was restoring sight to the blind. He was casting out demons. And guess who that attracted? Those in need. The Bible says that great crowds followed him and they gathered around him and they were hopeful that Jesus would meet their desperate needs. And when we have desperate needs, and when we see hope, we run towards that hope. I had the privilege a few months ago of going on a vision trip with a few pastors from our church over to Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka sits just below India, and we were looking at partnering with a ministry called Ignite Ministry. They have an amazing ministry model. They have these huge revivals that leads to church planting, which leads to people making a decision for Jesus, which leads to discipling those people in those relationships. And last year, Ignite Ministries, through their revival ministry, they planted 9,430 house churches. That led to 56,000 plus people giving their lives to Jesus and 47,000 plus people being discipled in that relationship. That's amazing. And so we flew about 30 hours. We drove eight hours to the most rural, remote part of Sri Lanka. And Josh Howard, who founded that ministry, he he said, uh, you guys are going to be the prayer team. And there were some locals that were part of the prayer team, too. And he said, I'm going to deliver a message, and then I'm going to invite people to come forward for prayer. And it was this most incredible scene. The first night, there were 5,000 people. The second night, 6,000. The third night, 7,000 people. There were thousands and thousands of people. The way that the Bible is describing when Jesus gathered around these desperate people coming. And they came desperate. And so Josh Howard preached a message, and at the end of it, he said, if anyone wants to come forward for prayer, come forward. And literally thousands of people are pushing into us, pressing in 
for prayer. And we had the privilege of seeing blind people gain their sight. We saw deaf people gain their hearing. We saw lame people get up and walk. I saw a guy that was carried in on a mat who was diagnosed with cancer, who was in his final days, get up and was healed and got up on the stage and gave his testimony and there were demons cast out. I mean, it was this book in the New Testament and the Gospels and the book of Acts coming alive in person. And when people are hopeless and when they see crowds and they see the, the hope in front of them, they come forward. And so we stayed literally every night for hours and hours praying over people who were desperate for hope. It's what we see in Matthew's gospel. It's what we saw when we were in Sri Lanka, people desperate for hope. And people found hope in Jesus and when you see and experience miracles firsthand, and you begin to believe that there is hope and that there could actually be hope for you and for your circumstances, you start to be transformed. And it's within that desperate and that hope-filled scene that Matthew is describing in what I read that Jesus steps in and he begins to preach the Sermon on the Mount, beginning with the Beatitudes. A sermon that wasn't preached to us, but it was certainly preached for us. Certainly the most famous sermon that Jesus ever preached, and arguably the most clear, impactful, and compelling sermon ever preached, and perhaps the most influential, life-altering, people-impacting, and history-changing message or manifesto ever created throughout the course of history. But it's a counterintuitive message. Jesus essentially says that those we think of as the failures are actually the winners. Blessed, he calls them. But why would Jesus start this amazing sermon describing people that the world sees as failing and describe them as the winners in the story? Why would Jesus highlight people that most of us would choose not to be like? The reason the reason I think is Jesus is making it clear that his kingdom is open to all people. And the first people that he invites are those who realize that they need him the most. And I just want to acknowledge that I think that's a really tough message for our church to hear. As residents of Milton and Alpharetta, Roswell, Sandy Springs, some of the most affluent, successful, high net worth people in our country we're likely gonna have a tougher time with this kind of message than most. Why? Because we are self-sufficient people, independent people, do-it-ourselves people. And why would the people in this room, you, want Jesus and what Jesus describes in the Beatitudes, poor in spirit, mourning, meek, Persecuted, you get the idea, not the things that us Miltonites put on our resumes. But he was preaching to a group of people who were everything he was describing. He was preaching to the broken, the hurting, the abandoned, the outcasts. But do you know what the difference is between the people that Jesus describes in the Beatitudes as blessed and us here today? Is the difference they knew they needed something different than what they had. And most of us in this room are perfectly comfortable exactly where we are. I love my life. I love my lifestyle. These people came to hear Jesus, and when he spoke, he spoke hope into them. And they would have heard Jesus' words, and they would have been sitting there shaking their heads sideways saying, no, Jesus, no, you're confused. We're not the blessed people. They've told us we're not the blessed people. We're the poor. We're the outcasts. We're the ones society has cast aside. Are you really saying that we're the blessed ones in your kingdom? But Jesus is intentionally inviting these people who feel like they're not worthy and don't belong to the kingdom of God to experience the richness of his kingdom. Another translation of blessed is congratulations. You're mourning. Congratulations. You're persecuted. Congratulations, you're poor in spirit. 
Congratulations. Why? Because yours is the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus is saying to these people in this message and to us today, I see you, I hear you, I defend you, I remember you, I reward you, and you need me. And while he's saying these things to these people in this passage in Scripture, I think he's also saying it for us today. Unfortunately, I think we can be deaf to the hope that Jesus offers. Instead of reaching our hand out to Jesus, we simply put our hand up and we say, Jesus, I got this. I'll call you when I need you. Each beatitude is its own invitation into a holy moment with Jesus. Now, I learned last week that in a room like this filled with hundreds of people that there are different levels of knowledge about the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes that Eliza read for us this morning. Before we started this series last Sunday, I just I randomly asked a couple of dozen people, what do you know about the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes? And the range of responses was pretty broad. Some, I got a, a, a deep theological understanding of what the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes were. Someone said, I think it's something that Jesus said. Another person said, wasn't that something that Moses carried down in the Old Testament or something like that? And a couple had no idea what the Sermon on the Mount or the Beatitudes were all about. And can I just say this morning that that I love that we are a church that attracts people from all different kinds of backgrounds and experience, people who have found hope and meaning, purpose and direction in this place, and they don't have to know everything about the Bible or about Jesus to feel welcome or at home in this church. And I love that we close every gathering with come back and invite someone to come with you because we want people who come here to feel comfortable inviting inviting other peoples and know that they will experience Jesus in this place. That's our church. We should be proud of who our church is. So since there's a wide range of church backgrounds and Bible knowledge in the room, I just wanted to give you a little context for this Sermon on the Mount that we're gonna be digging into over the next several weeks. The Old Testament ends in the book of Malachi with a 400-year period of silence. 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament, where so far as we know, God did not speak. No scripture was written, no voice of God to the people of God. The Jews had kind of been an autonomous empire with their own king, and now Babylon had wiped them out, Persia had ruined them, and they were being ruled by Rome. And the 400-year silence is broken in the first chapter of Matthew's gospel with the announcement of the coming of a new king, Emmanuel, God with us. A new king and a new kingdom. And then Matthew quickly moves to the public ministry of Jesus. Jesus is about 30 years old. He's begun to work many miracles, wonders, and signs. And all the miracles are leading to these large crowds that Matthew describes who are gathered around Jesus to witness to experience firsthand all that they're hearing about. And that's where Jesus delivers this Sermon on the Mount that includes the Beatitudes. Now, before we look at the eight Beatitudes individually, I just want to share some quick thoughts on them as a whole. The first one is that all Christians are meant to be the people Jesus describes in the Beatitudes as blessed. The characteristics that Jesus describes aren't reserved for saints or pastors or the uber holy. If you're sitting here today and you call yourself a Christian, Jesus is saying you should aim to embody the characteristics described in the Beatitudes, all eight, in full measure. It's a package deal. They just go together. They're like bacon and eggs. They're like mac and cheese. They're like Batman and Robin. They're like Georgia football and winning. They just go together. Somebody ought to say amen there. Some things we are just experiencing are meant to go together. Like the fruit of the Spirit. You don't just get one fruit of the Spirit. It's a package deal. It's not that some are meant to be poor in spirit and others are meant to mourn. All of us are meant to embrace 
all of the Beatitudes. And while one characteristic might manifest itself in a stronger way in one individual over another, they should all be evident in all of our lives as followers of Jesus. The second one is that none of these Beatitudes refers to a natural human tendency. Each Beatitude is kind of a disposition that's produced by produced wholly by grace and through the power of God's Holy Spirit. Nobody is like this naturally from birth. Jesus molds us over time into the characteristics that he's describing in the Beatitudes when we say yes to being a part of his kingdom. Third one, when Christians are different from the world, they actually attract the world. I think that's a little counterintuitive for us, but the more we become like Christ and the more we become unlike the world, the more the world sits up and takes notice and is actually attracted to us. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for what? Wealth, money, status, position, power. No, for righteousness. When we pursue the things of God's kingdom instead of the things of the world, the world notices that we are different. And when we live like Jesus, people are attracted to us and they are attracted to Jesus. The next one, when we live for the kingdom, we become less confident in our own ability. A non-Christian believes that he can do all things through his natural gifts and abilities. A Christian knows that he can only do all things through Christ who strengthens him. When we live for God's kingdom, we trust in him, not in ourselves. And the last one I wanted to point out is Christians and non-Christians. We, we belong to two entirely different kingdoms. That's probably obvious to you this morning. But simply put, you can't have residency in two kingdoms. You don't get dual citizenship. If we embrace the things of the kingdom Jesus describes, we'll feel less and less at home in what an earthly kingdom values and pursues. So Jesus... Jesus starts this epic sermon in verse two with the Beatitudes. And each group that he refers to as blessed, in Greek, it's makarios, it's happy or prosperous. And originally that word didn't even have any religious connotation. It was just used to refer to material security and prosperity. But Jesus kind of rewrites the definition as Jesus uses the word Blessed, it better translates congratulations, like I said before. And when we become the people that Jesus describes, he's basically saying, congratulations, you're poor in spirit, you're mourning, you're meek, you're persecuted. And what makes the Beatitudes so special is how powerful and unique each one is. In fact, each Beatitude is its own beautiful, holy moment. So can I ask you this morning, which one of the Beatitudes is most important? Maybe it's the poor in spirit. Mother Teresa is a great example of this. For 20 years, she did her ministry and mission on the streets of Calcutta among the poorest of the poor, and she literally took people who were dying in the streets of India. They would cast them aside. They would be sitting in gutters, and I had a friend who worked with Mother Teresa when she was alive and doing her ministry, and he said there would be people lying in the streets literally being eaten by rats, and Mother Teresa and her team would take those people and bring them indoors and allow them to die in dignity. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Others might say the mourners. People like Joseph of Arimathea who came and mourned with Mary and took Jesus' body and anointed it and buried it in the tomb reserved for his family. Maybe it's the mourners. But what about the meek? People today think meekness is weakness. Webster defines meek as mild Deficient in courage, submissive and weak. And I gotta tell you, I hate that definition. It's just so far from what Jesus meant when he says meek. Meekness is actually strength under control. Sadly, Webster's definition has ruined the biblical understanding of meekness. There are only two people in the Bible that are described as meek. Moses and Jesus. Certainly two of the strongest, most courageous people in all of Scripture. Meek people, 
Meek people are humble people and generous people, but they are not weak people. Blessed are the meek. We can certainly say that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, maybe they're the most important. That's a tough thing to do, fighting for righteousness. I have a friend, Bruce Deal, who 25 or 30 years ago saw the unrighteousness in downtown Atlanta in the Vine City area. And he and his wife, Rhonda, moved down there. It was the worst zip code for every negative statistic from crime to drug use to human trafficking. You name it, if it was a bad stat, they owned it in Vine City. And Bruce and Rhonda and their four daughters moved down there and they created City of Refuge, a nonstop, one-stop transformational hub in the hood to serve the most vulnerable. And City of Refuge is now replicated in multiple cities throughout the country bringing hope and healing to the most vulnerable people on earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Maybe it's the pure in heart. Those folks who um, know that what really makes a difference is the heart. It's where the decision to serve God is made. And it's where the decision to serve God is lived out, pure in heart. People like Noah, who God said was the only good, pure-hearted man left before he flooded the earth. Maybe being pure in heart is the most important. Speaking of putting lives on the line, what about the persecuted? The Open Doors organization says that every two hours a Christian is killed for their faith. 13 a day, nearly 5,000 people a year whose lives are sacrificed to advance the cause of Christianity around the world. And did you know that your generosity to this church is investing in that kind of work? People like the Algerian pastor who Bryce Norton, our global pastor, mentioned a couple of weeks ago, our church supports him. He is serving in a country in Algeria where it's not only illegal, but where he will literally be killed if the government finds out that he's a Christian sharing the gospel promise with non-believers. And that man's willing to be persecuted or even killed for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Blessed are the persecuted. Then there's the peacemakers. I love peacemakers. Not just people who keep peace, but people who actually make it. Nelson Mandela, Susan B. Anthony, Martin Luther King, Desmond Tutu. People who were willing to sacrifice everything, including their lives, just to bring peace. So which of the Beatitudes is most important? I know I said earlier that it's a package deal and we should embrace all and work to grow in all of them, but me, I think it's the merciful. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall inherit mercy. The more I look at Jesus' life in the Gospel of Matthew, I see a life immersed and saturated in mercy. Webster actually does a pretty good job with this definition. He says, mercy is extending compassion or forgiveness towards someone when it's within one's power to punish or to harm them. Obviously, Jesus is the ultimate example of this. But I think we could all be a little bit more merciful. Merciful to the woman who cut you off in traffic this week. And what you didn't know is that she was rushing to get to her first chemo treatment for the cancer diagnosis that she received last month. Merciful to the rude guy in the checkout line who, unbeknownst to you, just left a meeting with his attorney about the Chapter 11 bankruptcy that he's taken his company through that morning. Or Jesus. Jesus who had every right to give us what we justly deserve and instead went to the cross on our behalf. Mercy, mercy. Jesus was saturated in mercy. In everything he did and everything that he said, mercy. And it's my hunch that in these Beatitudes, he's actually calling us to be like him. 
I'm not talking about some kind of, of superhero, renowned biblical scholar, or a guy who's willing to go to Algeria and be a missionary to the people there. I'm simply talking about being the people that Jesus describes in the Beatitudes and doing it one holy moment at a time. I hear it said a lot that the kingdom of God is an upside down kingdom. I'd actually propose that the kingdom of God is the right side up kingdom and it's the world that's upside down today. But whatever the case and wherever your perspective, the kingdom that Jesus describes and invites you and me into in the Beatitudes is different from the kingdom that the world and the culture today tells us to pursue. And what I've found to be true in my life is that you can't pursue both kingdoms and have peace. You simply can't do it. I've tried, doesn't work. And if you're not sure which kingdom you're pursuing, ask yourself this one question. What would you ask God for today if you knew he would say yes? And I think your answer to that question will tell you a lot about whose kingdom your eyes are on and whose kingdom your heart is pursuing. Now, as we move to a time of prayer together, we'll have a prayer team up front. But I just want you to close your eyes for a minute with me. I want you to imagine yourself for just a moment standing toe to toe with Jesus. And Jesus is walking through the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the persecuted. Blessed are those who show mercy. And he looks you in the eyes and he says, which kingdom do you embrace? Is it my kingdom or is it an earthly kingdom? I suspect that if we had that toe-to-toe -to -toe encounter with Jesus right here, right now, some of us might be embarrassed by the response that we would have. Some of us would hear, well done, good and faithful servant. 